Hello and welcome to this week's Energy Future Exchange EFEX webinar. Um, my name is Max Grunig with the Ecologic Institute and I'm very happy to welcome here today Mike Messina with Woosh and he will explain us more about improving clean energy efficiency with fish. I'm very glad to have you here today, Mike. Uh, it's a real pleasure. It's a very interesting technology and I have to say something we don't talk enough, often enough, is, is um, how to improve hydropower, which is of course an important part of renewable energy in the whole world. Uh, everywhere where we go, hydropower is relevant, be it Germany, be it the United States, be it any aspiring developing country or anything in transition in between. Hydropower is really important and is crucial. And of course, wherever we go, it's the big question is about fish. And uh, whenever we are in countries that try to um, reduce the impact on the environment and the impact on fish. That's of course a crucial concern. Um, I've dealt with that myself being in an advisory board in a small renewable energy company in Germany and had a lot of dams in the Rhine River and uh, tributaries to the Rhine. So that's a huge issue in Europe. And so I'm really glad we can discuss this transatlantic or even global challenge here today with you. Um, and for everybody on the line, there's as always multiple ways to ask questions and uh, or, or uh, ask for clarification. So you can, if you see this on your control panel, you can see, you can raise your hand. That's one way. You can also um, type in a question in the chat function or in the question pane. So there's three ways how to interact with us. I hope you can figure this out. Uh, we'll try to also take your questions live. So open your microphone. If you're in a setting where you can't speak, no worries. I can still then read out your questions and ask Mike on your behalf. So either way, it will work. And we're eager to have a great conversation. Mike, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a, this is, this is a, an interesting forum and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, Max had asked that I speak on innovation in hydropower and in particular the, the technology that we've developed that kind of threads the needle or bridges the gap between uh, hydropower and fish that Max alluded to. Um, the very, in short, we make fish that move systems safely up and over dams. Um, and uh, this being the uh, energy future exchange, you might wonder what that has to do with clean energy and I, I will get to that shortly. Um, I'd like to open the discussion with a little bit of information on uh, hydropower as a clean energy source. And I need to be able to move my, hmm, excuse me just a moment. I'm not able to advance to the next slide here. Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so I think most people know that the renewables is a growing portion of of uh, power generation. Um, here in the US, it's somewhere between 12 and 15%, but as Max mentioned, it's, um, you know, hydropower is a significant portion of that. Here in the US, that's about 40% um, or close to it. And here in Washington, where I'm um, speaking to you from, yeah, that's uh, about 75% of our, our clean power is generated by by uh, hydropower. <clears throat> what, what might be of more, or might be new information to some of you out there is, is that of all the dams that are in the US, there's actually about 85,000 dams. I know most people, when they think of a dam, you think of a very large hydroelectric facility. Um, and there are about 2,500 of those here in the US, but all the rest of those 80, 80 plus thousand dams um, are irrigation dams, they are uh, flood control, they're much, typically much smaller. Um, and then over in the EU, there's uh, over 1,200, I think almost 1,300 um, larger hydropower producing dams, but again, thousands and thousands more of much smaller uh, dams. Um, Max had touched on um, uh, the importance of hydropower that remains within the renewable mix, and that uh, the reason for that, which 
again, I think maybe some people here know, is that it's, it's sort of a regulator. Um, it, it can manage and mitigate the uh, intermittencies that come with um, uh, wind and, and solar and, and forms like that. So at any rate, from hydropower is basically a, a steady stalwart, I suppose, uh, in terms of, of carbon-free power generation. And that's great from the clean energy perspective, but it's much less so for migratory fish. And this has led to somewhat of an image problem for the hydro industry. Fish runs have been in kind of a long, slow, downward spiral because passage is often it's a problem at, uh, at hydro facilities. Not every one of them, but several of them. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that has perhaps contributed to this issue is the hydro industry has been, or the way of moving fish up and over dams really hasn't changed. Um, it's really ripe for innovation. Um, so I want to show you this picture here. <clears throat> and there's a couple reasons I wanted to show you this, this picture. Uh, the first one is, um, if, if you look in the upper portion, you'll see a black and older black and white photo that's from the 50s. And that's of the Bonneville Dam, which is on the Columbia River here in Washington State. It uh, lies between Washington and Oregon. Um, the dam has been in place for, for many, many years. The fish ladder there. That picture was taken in the 50s and look at the picture down below is uh, from the 80s. <clears throat> now the two reasons I wanted to uh, make these distinctions here are one, you can see that it's really no different. They haven't done anything different for two generations and yet the, some of the problems that have been facing or have arisen in the last couple generations like climate change and drought and for, for fish there's invasive species, competition for habitat, things like that. Those have all come up, and they really haven't been addressing it in any different fashion. Um, so they're bringing the same solutions for, and but there's a new set of problems present. <clears throat> the other reason I wanted to point out this picture is if you can look at the water going down the ladder, um, it's it's a fairly significant amount. Um, to to run a fish ladder on a dam takes about five to ten percent of the river's flow. Um, <clears throat> And this is water that could be used for um, hydroelectric production. So what we've done is we have brought we've brought technology into um, a space that needs it, uh, the hydropower industry. Where, um, it, granted, there's a lot of technology in in turbines and things like that now, but the you know technology to benefit nature is something that uh, uh, we're able to catch up on, and so. We're working to try and make fish and hydro exist in harmony. Um, so what we've created are systems that we can, they're portable, we can bring them into the base of a dam. This, uh, this you see here is the Chief Joseph Dam on the Columbia River. So it's a portable and modular system and I will, I know we're a clean energy audience, but I'll give you a, a little bit of how the technology works for fish here um, uh, really quickly. So basically, we our systems, um, if you see that picture on the very bottom uh, where you're facing, facing the system, you see what looks like a very small first few steps of a fish ladder. That's called an attraction flow. And so the fish swim, they basically, they take the first couple steps of a fish ladder um, going up and into the system. So they swim up and then they slide forward through a scanner and that scanner, we have algorithms, um, artificially, artificial intelligence um, data gathering. We've built algorithms that can identify which fish um, are, are going through there. And so we can sort them and by species, by hatchery versus wild, and most importantly, by size. <clears throat> so if it's a larger Chinook salmon, the computer will say, well, sort it and route it to, you see these, uh, these tubes in the other pictures, they're very flexible. Uh, lanes um, will route them and using pneumatic, gentle pneumatic pressure through a, a tube that is misted, uh, we gently glide them up and over the dams. Um, so if it's a larger Chinook, it'll route it through lane one. If it's a smaller sockeye salmon, it'll route it through, say, lane two. If it's an invasive species or something that's not supposed to go up and over the dam, we can route it back, back out. Or if it's a hatchery fish, we can route to the hatchery. <clears throat> um, I mentioned 
that there's a mist inside the tube and that's important for three reasons. One, it uh, provides respiration for the fish. Two, it can provide the cold water, which climate change has really uh, played havoc with fish ladders because it, it leads to a lot of warm water coming down the fish ladders, which uh, at least on the Columbia River, salmon are not drawn to. Um, and then the third is it sets up that, that very gentle and easy glide. And biologically, why that's really important for fisheries restoration is that you know each of those female at least in, I'm, I'm kind of speaking on salmon here right now they they're carrying anywhere from three to five thousand eggs you know having them go up a fish ladder or in the back of a truck in a trap and haul operation leads to a lot of mortality it's a stressful stressful event um, this is a you know about a 20 second gentle glide and then they're gently deposited on the other side so more more fish up means more egg spawn which means more back down to continue the migratory cycle and that helps to fisheries restoration so that's maybe a bit well maybe a longer explanation than I should have given on the biological benefit but there are other benefits to uh, to this <clears throat> another one is the economic our systems are about 80 percent less than building and maintaining a fish ladder or setting up a trap and haul operation so uh, we make it very economical for hydro users to adopt this and solve the fish passage issue for them. Um, the third benefit though is a clean energy benefit which um, this being FX I'd, I'd kind of like to delve into a little bit or zero in on this a little. <clears throat> um, in a nutshell you don't need the fish ladders anymore. Recall that I said about five to ten percent of the river's water goes down the fish ladder. So now the producer can, the dam owner can use that water for um, increased power generation and from their perspective that can potentially be increased revenue too. Um, <clears throat> so what I think is uh, Im important in, you know, on a micro level there's those benefits for at the dam, but on a broader macro level if you look at um, or if you extrapolate this out across hydropower grids across the US or you know, around the world, <clears throat> bringing technology like this to dams can um, increase their efficiency. So if you can avoid the need for ladders, you increase hydro's efficiency by a commensurate 5 to 10% approximately. Um, there's also another element too, which I'll touch on in, in a little, you know, in a few minutes. Um, well, let me back up though. <clears throat> I guess, in extrapolating out across the, of, of squeezing out an extra five to ten percent, I want to give you an analogy. I had done a blog article for the Clean Energy Business Network. It was you know, several months ago, um, but if you look at a hydropower facility as an engine, and you, or or even a grid or a, or a hydro system as uh, an engine, and I would say that it is. <clears throat> When you add a piece of technology to an engine that increases its, say, like on a car, increases the horsepower, you add a turbocharger to it, you can increase the horsepower or increase the efficiency um, without adding new facilities. So you don't have to build new power plants and you don't have to add new, um, uh, new power transmission infrastructure. So um, where the whole hydro industry is ripe for innovation is it's a simple fix that gains some efficiency without building something all brand new. No new facilities, no new transmission infrastructure. Um, the other piece about non-power dams is something I'm going to come to in just a minute when I talk a little bit about um, some of the, the policy considerations in both the U.S. and the EU. <clears throat> so in, in shifting to policy, um, the U.S. and the EU both certainly have, well, they certainly have their bureaucratic challenges. Um, um, you know, on power generation and, and things like that are often, uh, there's a lot of government agencies that are involved. Here in the U.S., there are not just federal um, entities, there are state fish and wildlife departments, there are state uh, clean energy goals, like here in Washington, we, we're aiming for um, 
we have a clean energy goal of 100% renewables by 2045. Um, but you know, here in what here in the U.S. we have uh, around dams. The Nas National Marine Fisheries Service is involved. The Department of Energy is involved. Uh, often there is the Army Corps of Engineers or the Bureau of Reclamation, and of course. Uh, um, the FERC, who handles the relicensing or the licensing of, of all the dams. Now, what's I had talked a little bit about. Um, well, the Department of Energy has identified. I talked a little bit previously about about non-power dams. There are over eighty thousand non-power dams across just the U.S. And the Department of Energy and Oak Ridge National Laboratories did a big study several years ago and identified around 50,000 dams that could have you know smaller hydro retrofitted to them so that they could be uh, become they could add carbon free power to the grid one of the problems in doing that though in developing that that could be enticing for a lot of small hydro developers but all FERC relicensing usually, usually requires um, fish passage so <clears throat> fish actually are one of the keys toward um, unlocking some some of the clean power on, on a lot of these dams. Now the um, fish passage in the old way of thinking of things, of, of doing things as we've always done it, like putting in a fish ladder or or setting up a trap and haul operation, on a small dam, which most of those 50,000 dams are, it becomes a giant percentage of the capital expense in retrofitting or building this out or uh, you know making this dam become a powered dam you know a fish ladder can cost you know say five to ten million dollars and on a small dam um, that's a, a way too big of a portion of the budget so it becomes economically you know not feasible um, now using uh, using our technology we can we can actually move a lot more of those those back into the realm of possibility, which is something, or economic possibility, which is something we're uh, working on on making people aware of. <clears throat> you know, I, I talked about both the U.S. and the EU having you know, different layers of bureaucracy. Um, the U.S. has somewhat of a, when it comes to fish anyway, somewhat of a don't touch approach, the Endangered Species Act. Um, is one, and we're and we're we've been working with the regulatory agencies to, um, you know, we've shown them all our studies and um, been having them do our, show them how our system works, and so we we are making good regulatory progress there. But in the EU, they have a little more of a, we recognize this is a problem, let's fix it, uh, issue in terms of policy. And in the EU, there is there's a couple things. There's the Water Framework Directive. And that is that is a mandate by the European Commission to all member nations to provide river connectivity for migratory species. Um, and remember, there's an awful lot of dams across Europe, and so that's that's a big a big fix. Um, there's also the National Energy and Climate Plans, which I think was a topic of one of your um, FX blogs previously. Um, the National Energy and Climate Plans basically say increase renewables by 2030. Well, where our technology is involved, this actually works quite well with the two of those things. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Let's just say a, I'll give you a hypothetical. Say you have a hydroelectric producer. Um, he's now facing this, uh, this new regulation coming out that says you have to put fish passage on these dams and you've been running and they, they haven't had them before. It hasn't been required. Um, well, let's just say he's got, let's say this company has 20 dams, and again, this is purely hypothetical, um, and they're quite sizable, and so I just, I pay, say, 18 million euro for each one, that becomes a new regulation suddenly costs them 360 million euro is a giant capital expense to get this all put in place. And what kind of troubles me is that is a significant amount of money to purchase 80-year-old technology to go to go put fish ladders on on 20 dams. Why? I mean, I can buy an iPhone, the latest iPhone, for a few hundred dollars, but I wouldn't go spend 1,000 times that amount to go buy a landline phone. 
um, you know, why not use the most available, the most cutting edge technology out there? So our systems, because we're portable and modular, we're very easy to add in. Um, and um, it becomes a good solution for, for the power producer because uh, it also becomes a very good solution for the fish because it allows them passage and opens up river miles for more habitat restoration. Um, but having to put, if they were to go the old way and have to put fish ladders on the dams that don't have them, that's going to cut into their power production. They have to suddenly now, they're not required to pour 5 to 10% of the water down the fish ladder. So what we kind of tie this all up in a bow for, for them is um, we can save fish, we can help them boost their revenue or not have to lose their revenue, um, help them meet their policy goals for, uh, for the WFD, and help the country, of course, meet their NECP goals because they can produce more clean hydropower. Um, so that's um, for, you know, what we're what we're working on in the EU is is bringing both hydro companies and and, and policymakers to make them aware of it. Um, <clears throat> there's one other area that this innovation we've tried to bring innovation into this trying to solve this problem is uh, finance. <clears throat> we have what we call passage as a service where, and, and these numbers here are, are round numbers and hypothetical, but <clears throat> it's much as you would imagine, like software as a service. Um, you know, our, our systems are portable and modular. They can get reg be regularly updated, but where this, the financial benefit comes in is or the innovation comes in is, is bringing that model to an old industry like hydro so <clears throat> we can come in and say look you won't need that fish ladder anymore or you won't be required to build one that means you're not that's five to ten percent of the value of that water say you if you don't need the fish ladder anymore let's just call it ten percent i'll use round numbers we can take that ten percent of extra water you're going to gain and from the from the hydro producer's point of view, that's revenue. There's a value to that. Um, and in fact, we did a. There's a study that was done on the Columbia River, which showed the value of water that goes down fish ladders alone on only eight dams was $25 million per year. Um, so it, it's it's sizable. Um, but again, multiply this across dams across the world, and, and we can really save a lot of water and, and produce a lot more power. But to do that, though, it doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be a giant capital expense. If the revenue, if the hydro producer is willing to share in that extra 10% with us, we'll put the system in for them. We'll do all the maintenance. We'll do all the software updates and regular. Basically, we'll take care of the fish passage issue for them. And to be frank, I would like to think every, you know, hydro producers are all ultra altruistic, or all energy producers are. Um, but they are first and foremost about generating power and making money. The fish issue is somewhat secondary. Um, so if we can solve that for them, take that off their plate, split that extra 10% with us. So we can set up a power purchase agreement and where maybe we take 5%, you're still five, the hydro producer is still 5% ahead of where it was. It's whatever is negotiated. But the point is we can basically make it very easy and painless, put it in as an operating expense and not a significant one-time capital expense um, and, and basically take care of the problem over time for them, you know, continually with the service. Um, in this example here, you see fish ladder at Clay Ellum Dam. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's just one dam, the price for a fish ladder as created by the, as, as developed by the um, Bureau of Land Management, uh, the federal government agency. Um, so that's a, a giant capital expense to, to build a fish ladder um, and it doesn't doesn't uh, handle any of the maintenance and operation um, it will require water going down which means less on the dam or less for production um, but probably that most important thing is the middle one where it says it cannot be updated when you put a fish ladder in it's a concrete pour and it there it stays and so you better hope that that's where the fish are going to go um, our, our modularity and portability allows us to 
be continually adaptive to the whims of nature. We can move things around to work what's best. So um, <clears throat> um, I guess that kind of summarizes how fish, I guess to wrap up, I wanted to mention that, you know, overall hydropower is a very important piece of the renewable uh, energy picture. It remains so and uh, will remain so for quite a while. But innovation is sorely needed and we've we've brought that and we are trying to make it as easy as possible by not only, we're trying to solve a lot of problems, making it biologically safe for fish, um, providing more clean water so that more clean energy can be produced. So there's, um, you know, we're getting more carbon-free power production out of something that's already there. Uh, we can make it pay for itself and it can fit with both state and federal level policy goals. Um, and so we're, we're pretty excited about our technology and we're working on trying to get it out there to the world. And um, if you have any questions about it um, or have any, any thoughts on places that could, could really make use of this, I'd like to know about them. Um, I'll be happy to go talk. So um, I, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that was really, really interesting because, of course, you, you mentioned this that um, it's very flexible. It can it can mm -hmm. uh, go to where the fish want to go uh, instead of the fish ladder. Because I've seen that in practice that you build a very, very nice, beautiful fish ladder, and uh, but it's not on the right spot or the spot shifts maybe because yeah. it changes and and well, then. What do you do then, right? Uh, then you have the fish ladder. It's it's certified, so it counts, but you don't get fish up going up river. Right. It checks a box for the hydro producer, but it really doesn't solve any problems. Yeah. Um, and the, the climate climate change has really made it. It's been made a difference on fish ladders in that when water slows at the top of a dam, the water for a fish ladder comes from the top. So when warm water starts to come with climate change, the water's warming. Warm water comes down the ladder, in the, at least in the case of salmon, they're confused by that at the bottom of the ladder. They don't know where to go. Right. Um, and so fewer of them have been going up, which has led to some of the declines. They're not spawning. Yeah, yeah. No, excellent, excellent. We we have already the first question from, uh, from participants. So I don't want to take up uh, uh, the whole time, but I do have more questions, but I'll come, I'll come uh, later. Um, sure. Chris, let's see if maybe Sabina, uh, if, if she can talk to us, otherwise I'll have to read it out. But Sabina, thank you for joining us and um, thank you for coming up with a, uh, or asking a question. Hi, Sabina. So I've unmuted you, Sabina. You should you should be able to talk. Otherwise, I can read out the question. Okay. So she says she cannot talk. Okay. Then I'll do my very best to to read this out. So um, she would like to know um, about the reverse process. So about the young fish going down again. And uh, and there's a second question too. It's more about the general process. So in both ways. Uh, whether you need human operators for operating the system. So, and she says, thank you very much. And it was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll take those in reverse order. So we have, we have, we make systems that can be hand loaded, like on a much smaller, that might apply in a much smaller dam scenario. Um, but our, yeah, I don't know. Some some may have seen there were some videos that really went viral this this summer, um, which you know our system has been 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 called the salmon cannon. As the marketing guy, I kind of shy away from that. But these videos showed you know a scientist hand loading a salmon into the tube, um, which that's actually that video was from five years ago. That's five year old technology. Um, we now make systems like the one I showed, where the fish swim in completely on their own. Everything is automated. There are no, it's, there is no human needed. It actually functions much in the way it, it stays in sleep mode, much like a laptop. And once uh, it senses a, a, the approach of a fish, 
just like touching the the mouse pad on your your laptop it open it turns on and you know the computer lights up and and the fish comes in and he gets it's what we call swim slide and glide he swims in slides through and gets glided up and over the dam um so the short answer to that second question is no we human you know manpower is human resources are not required um it might make more sense on a there may be instances where it makes more sense to use a smaller system which which does have hand loading on a smaller setting um, where it's not a constant need. But the other question about the smaller fry or smolt coming back down, there are um, a few different solutions that can be used. There are things called floating surface collectors. There are um, um, ways of routing them straight over through increased spill or through, um, through uh, uh, raceways that go down the side of a dam. Um, we're actually working on a few other things that um, to solve that. We, we believe we've got the upstream portion uh, fixed and, and or figured out, and now we're we're uh, working on developments for downstream as well. So there are solutions out there. We're working on improving those as well. Excellent, wonderful. Um, so just to Follow up a little bit because you mentioned it can be used. It's it's fully automated. Um, can be used both in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, you also mentioned earlier there's a lot of paperwork attached to uh, yeah. the regulation. Uh, do, do you have to be certified, uh, or or is that something where you can just say, okay, this is basically like a fish ladder, or it's uh, equivalent? Or, or do you have, have to have an official certification? You do need to get some, yeah, you do, at least here in the US, you do need to get some approvals. Um, in the EU, there are different different jurisdictions that I guess have differing layers that we're just, just starting to get, um, get familiar with. Um, but it does seem to be easier in the EU or getting more traction. Um, it, it, it's interesting, the, here in the US, it's very, Salmon recovery um, is, well, or, or, or fish, fish recovery um, is a really big thing. And because of that, there's a lot of government agencies that have a lot of public pressure from, from all kinds of conservation groups and, and, and things like that. So they wind up having to really rely on the black and white letter of the regulations that might be set in place because they're afraid they might get sued if they do something different. But we're, we're working on, you know, we're working with both NGOs and conservation groups and regulators to get everybody onto the same page. And it's not something that happens overnight, but we're really making some progress on that and um, getting a lot more receptivity to the notion of this hasn't been working. We really need to try something or work on, you know, there's a different way. Um, and so that's, um, in the EU, it seems there is also uh, quite a bit of, um, it's also a hot topic, but the regulatory agencies do seem to have a little more latitude towards saying, yeah, we could consider that. Great. So, so you mentioned NGOs and the environment groups, and I think now I hear feedback. So if, if you have a moment Either, either switching or, or to, to the, the other audio. Uh, now it's good. Now, now I don't have feedback, but I don't know if you can hear me still. I know, I can hear um, you fine. Okay, good, good. Um, so is the reaction of the environment community different if you compare the US and Europe and, and how's the response anyway? Are they do they buy your story basically, or are they very skeptical? And do they have uh, want to see uh, long-term studies before they want to get on board, or how's how's their reaction spectrum? <laughs> well, their reaction actually is a spectrum. I mean, there are there are uh, I mean there are NGOs who who are somewhat militant all dams must come down and there are others who say 
we need to solve the fish problem and you know any way that we can get to do it we should consider let's take a look at it. we have so I, I actually you know we don't disagree that there are dams that probably should come out um, particularly in Europe there's a lot of very small river barriers dams that aren't even used anymore um, the only thing they do now is block migratory paths so yes it, taking dams out is not a big deal and in fact that's something we can help with I mean we can move fish around taking a dam out is particularly a big one is a large undertaking we can keep fish safely moving around while that process goes on um, but most most people most NGOs particularly some of the larger ones that have you know national presence and uh, you know policy offices in DC and such they have much more of a realistic approach saying pretty much everybody agrees from if you're to look at migratory fish from a natural standpoint sure it would be better if the dam wasn't there but most people are realistic about the fact that it is there and it's not easy to take out and if we did there'd be a very a clean energy impact a significant one um, and so most people are most NGOs are are fairly realistic about that, and uh, we do have we've done over 20 different studies now that are all on our website, and um, um, so yeah, we're in we spend time educating all the stakeholders, whether it's you know tribal groups, actually the the tribes and First Nations groups in Canada and are quite receptive to our technology because. Um, and they've adopted some of our portable systems already um, because they're very big on fisheries restoration. Um, you know, so if there's a, a way to get to restore their fisheries, which are very important to their culture, they're all for it. So it, it's, uh, I guess I've come a long way around in answering that multiple stakeholders have multiple opinions, but I, I guess I was trying to explain where each, some of the different ones along the spectrum come from. I hope I, hope I answered that question okay. Right. Yeah. No. I know you did. You did. And obviously, it's 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 not um, you know it's not easy to tell people look it's 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 bad, but you can make it better because for some people it's a black or white question, and then yeah. they they feel like a compromising on the bigger target of taking down the dam maybe if they make the dam better. So that's that's sometimes a, a challenge for. Um, people in the policy field, but you're, of course, you're in the business. So let's go back to your technology. Just mm -hmm. from, you said you can do dams and you can do small dams and you can do large dams, but what's what's kind of the, what would you say is the technical limit? Mm -hmm. Like, could you do a dam like the Hoover Dam? Uh, yes, we could. There, there's not, what's interesting about the technology is, <clears throat> is it's fairly simple. Um, we're using pneumatic pressure, but because we're using a mist in the tube, we're not having to move a large column of water. Say, say you have a thousand foot run. If you fill that whole thing with water, that's an awful lot to move. Um, all we're moving is a f one fish that might be 15 pounds or 20 pounds. And, um, and it's and we set up a very gentle glide so we only have to change the pressure behind the fish by about one bar and it just and it you know starts to gently glide we have sensors all along so that we can actually they move they can move at about 22 feet per second and um or excuse me 22 miles per hour but we can actually decelerate them again slow them back down um, as they're approaching the end of the run and then gently deposit them in the river um so uh, to answer your question, because we're not because we're not moving much mass, height is not not so much an issue for us. Um, we you know we we could do the Grand Coulee Dam. I believe we could do the Hoover Dam. Um, you know we could almost go straight up, but um, don't need to. Okay, that that sounds scary, but it seems the fish yeah. aren't scared, so they they can do this. And, no, they're not. Uh, we, There's been studies on that. Cortisol is what measures stress in fish. And comparing a fish ladder and a truck ride and our our system, the levels of cortisol found in fish in that went 
through ours was was negligible compared to the others. It was almost nothing because it happened so fast for them. It's just, you know, 20 seconds of suddenly gliding and, oh, here I am. So, um, so great. So, so you said, I mean, your technology is already around for a few years and, and you're, uh, of course, you're improving it. It's more automated now and you also benefit from the advances in artificial intelligence and, and, and automation in general. Um, but what, what do you, where do you see your company going? Is that mostly um, the US and Europe for now? Or what about Asia or Latin America? Are these important areas as well? Yes, they are. Um, we are a very small company with um, global ambition and global reach. Our, um, you know, we, we do have some representatives in Europe and in Australia, New Zealand, and um, our CEO just got back from China about a week and a half ago. My, one of my colleagues is headed to South America tomorrow. Um, so yes, we do have interest uh, from all over the world. So where I see us going is global. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah. So so um, just because I'm from Europe, within Europe, uh, wh where's the biggest uh, interest or uptake right now? Uh, do do you feel free to name a country? <laughs> sure. Um, <clears throat> probably. We, well, we have some pretty decent interest in uh, uh, Germany and Switzerland. Germany, though, has a lot of low, low rivers, um, uh, where probably the most opportunity is is coming from is uh, Sweden. We have a couple systems system components uh, going there right now, and um, Spain and Portugal are also uh, quite quite. Uh, active and our, our representative is in is in Austria so that might be why Austria Germany and Switzerland we've been getting some you know some inquiries there because he's generating them but we've been getting inquiries from um, Spain and Portugal and uh, um, and the, Nor the Nordic Nordic countries we have another representative in, in uh, Sweden as well um, and that's why we have some systems going in there there's actually quite a bit of hydropower in in the Scandinavia. Right, exactly, exactly. And that also leads to another topic because it's it's both traditional hydropower, but we also use uh, both in Austria and and also in the Scandinavian countries. Pumped storage is an mm -hmm. issue. Uh, and yep. so I have another question here from Sabina, and I'm trying to read this out, and she acknowledges it's it's a slightly off topic or maybe tangential, but since you seem to be a real expert in in the matter of hydropower in general, so I'm gonna read this out and then you can decide how, how far you wanna venture into this. Uh, so Sabina asked, this is a little bit off topic, but since you seem to be very knowledgeable on fish restoration, I'd like to ask you whether pumping water up to store energy is bad for the fish? Um, you know, I, am, I would say I'm not an expert on pump storage and the mechanics of it. Um, yeah, I, don't, I honestly don't know that I am have the expertise to answer that question because I don't, I haven't gotten into the mechanics of, of, of how really how they do it in, you know, in general. Um, we can make sure it's not by using our systems to move the, you know, transport the fish so right. that they're not in the way. So we can make it a non-issue. I guess I could say that. Good. Well, that's a response too. And and I think <laughs> kind of a backwards was, one. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Well, well, but it's it's positive. And and she says thank you. So she's she's happy with the answer. And um, yeah. So I I mean I think. Um, you mentioned a lot of the smaller dams, and that's, of course, especially in Europe, in, in, um, we have a lot of small dams in, in smaller rivers, and mm -hmm. uh, we, especially in Germany, where we don't have the gradient, as you see mm -hmm. that maybe in more extreme cases, like in Washington State. Um, so that's kind of interesting uh, as an application. Of course, 
One aspect is you offer this uh, with a low investment as a pay for service, which is very mm -hmm. interesting. But are there some people uh, who are more set on owning the system? And is that, um, is that something you, you also, also offer or is there a lease yeah, model? Yeah, that's certainly an option, yes. Uh, we, if they want to just straight buy it, that's fine. Um, and, you know, it, it depends. If, you know, if it's a large utility, maybe they have that kind of capital behind them. Maybe they don't want to share their power revenue. Um, and, it make, you know, they can pencil it out and go, it makes more sense to just go borrow the money or, or you know, sell bonds or whatever. And, or just we have the capital, let's do it. Um, but for a lot of smaller hydros, like I remember a, a small hydro owner from Sweden kind of worried about the water framework requirements. He said, he said, I, I inherited this dam. I don't even know what to do. I mean, to, to put passage on here would be, uh, is going to cost me a huge amount of money that I wasn't, I didn't even plan on owning the dam, much less spending, spending to maintain it in this way. So um, those are the kinds of groups we're trying to reach out to, to kind of say, you know, we can, we can really help solve your, keep you in compliance and solve your problem. And, um, and, you know, we, we call ourselves a fish first company, even though I'm talking to you guys about clean energy, but we like to solve the problems for fish too. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. Well, two, two questions, uh, they're directly related. It's, it's about, um, the all year operation ability or, uh, weather conditions that might set limits on when you can run it. I mean, you mentioned already with climate change, water gets warmer. Um, and that can be an issue. And so your system, of course, the fish is missed it. So that probably cools it off automatically. Well, we uh, cool but, the water on, on that barge you saw that system, it, the water goes through a, a, a chiller. And okay. so it's, it's, we can set it to the temperature that the biologist tells us that's what the fish want. Great. So there is no operational limit for how hot it can be as long as there's water available. Yes. Great. And, and conversely, you know, in winter, like winter conditions, we can operate there too, where, you know, we have, we do have to provide winterizing and, and some conditioning for it. But um, also some of it happens to go along, kind of depends on the river. If the river is big enough that has many different species, you might keep the system in for most of the year. And maybe, you know, maybe we, we do our, our, our annual maintenance or something on the, on the system that we'll come and do. Could be, you know, when the, during the months the fish are not running. Um, but if it's a system where the fish run four months out of the year, you know, maybe, maybe you would do it differently, you know, where you don't, you, know, you can lay it up into storage for, for the other, for the balance of the year. Great. And um, since you said you have to do maintenance occasionally and in some places maybe more frequently, but you said once a year would be one idea. Uh, how many people do you need to have on site and do you get local contractors or do you have to have your own crew out there to, to provide maintenance? Um, how does that work in practice? At the moment, it's our own crews and we add, you know, we add workers as needed, you know, from you know, from those different locations, um, where we really hope to go is, you know, building out different markets. In particular, the EU is a uh, a primary target market for us. But to be able to um, <clears throat> contract with local local reps for for handling the the ongoing maintenance and any issues that are needed. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I see a lot of positive feedback here. There's uh, Shireen um, Miller, she says, uh, thank you, very interesting. Shireen, if you want to ask something, just let us know. I'm, I'm not gonna open your microphone if, if, if you don't indicate you would like to ask something, but just everybody be known uh, that you can still ask a question. We still have a few minutes left in the webinar, so don't worry about asking even a little bit off topic questions. Uh, Mike seems to be That's ready fine. for for anything. Um, then 
Mike, coming back, you talked a lot about uh, salmon and the focus uh, seems to be on some species. Do you have um, the ability to cover any species or do you have it limited currently to a certain set? Um, yeah, I guess it were, it's both. <laughs> um, right now we, we've moved 23 different species so far, um, but we're always testing more. Um, right now they're, they fall within a, a size range. Like right now we not yet able to move very tiny, tiny fish, but we're actually are testing new entry systems for that. So I'm try me again in a few months and maybe we'll have an answer. Um, really, really large fish like sturgeon. We have moved lake sturgeon. We can move them, um, but we don't currently, we don't we've really not had call for it. So we don't have tubing that big. It's not right. to say we couldn't create it. Um, but, you know, at the moment, our kind of our sweet spot is between, say, two and 35 pounds. Yeah. Okay. It's quite a good range. Um, but still, uh, you, you're, uh, of course, the question is then, do you, do you have to have different tubing for the different species or is that one tubing for all? No, it'd be, it, well, it's not, it doesn't necessarily go by species. It would go by size. So when they go through the scanner, they, in about a half second, they glide forward through the scanner. There's 18 rapid fire images taken. Computer quickly compares to um, to what it knows and has been taught, and makes a sorting decision. So it could be a a salmon followed by a steelhead, but if they're both about the same size, they'll go through the same tube, which is for that size fish, and that and it has a range. So it would be, you know, uh, any fish with a girth that's, you know because these tubes are flexible and fish are somewhat flexible, they work together to form a pneumatic seal. Um, so if it's, if it's too much smaller, you won't get enough pressure to, to build the seal to move them. So they would go through the smaller tube. Um, so it's the sorting. Yeah, I guess long story short, the sorting is done by, um, by size. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do have ways of, of doing also, like hatchery versus wild, you can identify them and, and then route them accordingly. Okay, great, great. Uh, we do have a question from Shireen and I'll ask, uh, I'll see if she can ask herself. Uh, I've unmuted you. Shireen, are you there? Yes, my question more is thinking about the uses for maybe, you know, when you were mentioning the Endangered Species um, Act and things for other agencies maybe to to increase funding for this type of technology. And my question was basically, does the scanner have the capability to really look at the fish population numbers to determine if they're a healthy population? And, you know, maybe share that data with these agencies that may be able to, you know, help promote your product. Well, actually it does and we are. Um, it, it's actually, I'll tell you a real quick story that's kind of interesting. We have one of our scanners, just the scanner, on um, that Bonneville Dam where I showed you the ladder. Um, and we that went in this year. And we get these images. You know, most fish counting is done on the Columbia River. They kind of look through a window. They have a person there with a clicker. I mean, that's right out of the 1980s. Again, we're kind of ripe for innovation. But so the images we get, because the fish are very in a split second, kind of quickly dewatered as they go through the scanner, and then they're back in water again. Um, we get very vivid pictures or images, um, they are almost artistic. But on that Bonneville scenario, we were noticing the fish that were coming through were a lot of them had damage. And this was pinniped damage, uh, sea lions, because sea lions like to wait at the bottom of a fish ladder and you know, have dinner. The fish are milling around, but the I guess the point is, you know, we were seeing fish with bites out of them and, and puncture wounds, and so yes. To long story short, we were kind of surprised by the high percentage of fish going through that feature that had those features, and we did we have been sharing that information with the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of. Uh, 
an unintended result, but one that we hope will help them with their uh, planning on how to deal with the issue. Wonderful. Shireen, does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. I was just thinking of like that idea of just multiple people being interested in that. Yeah, we're we're trying to, <laughs> yeah, we're a small 12 person company trying to tell the world how we can, you know, boy, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of information that comes from this technology and you guys can make use of it you guys can make use of it and you know you guys can make use of it as well so um yeah we are we are working with the different agencies to share that info excellent well thank you also for asking that question shireen and i hope of course that this will then also inform science uh, maybe you can even have um, phd students or universities work with you is that already something in the planning or happening? Yeah, we, we do work to develop partnerships. Again, because we're so small, it's helpful to have partners out there. And um, we have a partnership with a, a, a technical um, institution here in Washington where, uh, in fact, next week we're going to be up there kind of educating their students on the uses of newer technology like this. And again, not doing things kind of the same way they've always been done um, because that hasn't really panned out. And uh, so, so yes, uh, we do partner with, with academia. Um, we partner with, partner with anybody that has, you know, shares a joint vision of trying to not, trying to not, trying to think forward and not just uh, think, well, this is the way we've always done it and that's the way it should continue to be done. And that, that's not a philosophy we subscribe to. So any partner that we can find that is a forward thinker, we'd love to talk. Excellent. So let's make this a big call out there. I know that some of the participants on this webinar are from different universities. So maybe maybe they'll hear it, maybe they pass it on and maybe they'll alert their colleagues. And also maybe uh, since it's is being recorded and we post it online later. Maybe the other colleagues of theirs will see it as well. I think it's a very fascinating technology. It, it seems, uh, I mean, it's relatively simple in a way that it's kind of straightforward, but of course the detail, the implementation is rather complex and uh, requires a lot of um, programming and a lot of uh, brains actually compared to a fish ladder, which is supposed to just work, um, but then doesn't very often. So it's exciting. Well, the, the beauty of the technology piece um, is that it can continue, continually be updated, just like you get regular updates on your laptop or whatever, you know, say you're using Microsoft, you know, one of their programs. Every now and again, you get a update um, ours will do the same thing. So we could take a river basin approach where you have our systems on multiple points on the river and it gets to know the more fish that get scanned and go through, the, the, smarter, the smarter the systems get and all that information can then be downloaded back down to all the systems in the basin. So um, it's just, it's dynamic, I guess, rather than static. Yeah. yeah. That sounds sounds really great. I, I would love to see it in practice. So just uh, for for closing, so we can see it. Uh, maybe you can name a few places where we could go and see it. Ah, uh, boy, the place. <laughs> I I guess I would have to get back to you with the name of the place in Sweden. Um, uh, we have um, we have systems in uh, Washougal in. In Washington uh, at a hatchery uh, we have a couple different hatchery applications uh, the large system you just saw on the Chief Joseph Dam is um, we're hoping to put that back out on the Columbia soon uh, that was part of a, a pilot study for our that was our first implementation of the floating system um, so uh, so yeah let me see well Sweden yeah. sounds good, and if yeah. you if you do remember the name, just uh, send it to me, and I can put it in. Yeah, the... I'm sorry, I don't want to butcher it. It's... <laughs> no, of course, of course not. And I hope you'll have a lot more application sites very, very soon. Maybe already 
uh, in the next spring. And so, Mike, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for answering all the questions, even the ones that are a little bit off or tangential. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Come on, I was well, thank you so much. And then also, of course, I want to thank everybody else for joining, for asking questions, or also for just listening. Please tell other people about this technology. Contact Mike um, at Bush, and also, of course, stay in touch with us. There is a LinkedIn group for Energy Future Exchange for EFAX, where you can also share information. And Mike, maybe you can share information there about uh, locations for the Bush system. That's and a great idea. Course, I'll find yeah. out exactly where you can go there. Exactly. <laughs> then you can have the Google coordinates. And then just a short um, advertisement. We'll have more webinars coming in the Energy Future Exchange, but we'll also have a webinar in the postcard cities of tomorrow coming up on Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's about the circular economy with a group called Cradle to Cradle. So if you're interested in that topic, then join us next Monday. Thank you so much, Mike. Have a great weekend, everybody. And Thanks. see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.